Hi, I'm Mary Greendale and this is Just Thinking. Today I'm outdoors sitting atop the Eight Arch Bridge on the uh, rail trail and I, my guest today is Marjorie Turner Holman who is a resident of Bellingham who uh, volunteered to help with the committee that started almost five years ago, maybe more, uh, to restore this bridge that we're sitting on top of. Marjorie showed up at one of our first meetings and it was uh, a joy to meet her because she is someone who spends a lot of time finding easy walks. Now that's, that's something I think that we need to define. So Marjorie, we're gonna start with welcome. Glad to have you with me today. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me, Mary. Well, it's my pleasure. And uh, first, thank you for your help and your enthusiasm and with the project that we're perched atop. Everybody in Holliston loves this and- It's exciting. It I'm... is exciting. And we were, <laughs> we were very proud of our little oh. group that just kind of spurred life to the uh, to the initiative. So absolutely. At any rate, so easy walks. What's an easy walk? Great question. It's one of the first things that I uh, we're going to be talking about my latest book, Finding Easy Walks Wherever You Are. And that's one of the first things that I did talk about in that book is what makes an easy walk? Because lots of people have different ideas about easy walks. It depends on what you're looking for. Uh, for me, my target audience is parents with young children, people who are older, who maybe haven't been this active as they are now in the pandemic, and people who are either permanently or temporarily with mobility challenges. And easy walks, I'm, I fit into the person who has permanent mobility challenges, and so easy walks for me means not too many roots, not too many rocks, relatively level and something of interest along the way. Everything else is, is different. Uh, it also means, pro at least for me, about under two miles. But again, that's extremely variable. By, it's a very individual kind of thing. People think that if it's shorter than five miles, no matter what the trail surface is, it must be easy. And I am all about trail surfaces because I do have paralysis. My, my right ankle is nearly completely frozen. So I really, I need solid surfaces or at least um, surfaces that I can get help with. That's part of why I use hiking poles. Yeah. I recommend them for anyone who has any kind of balance issues or older and are saying, oh, I just can't do that, I'll tip over. They make a huge difference and have saved me many, many falls. So does that give you a yeah. pretty clear idea of what easy walks are sure. in my book? <laughs> sure, <laughs> okay, let's talk about the book. The first book was actually Easy Walks in Massachusetts, wasn't exactly. it? Exactly. Okay, and so was that all of Massachusetts or were no, you no, were focused no. just here? Um, it, uh, I live in Bellingham and so um, I basically, w when I started writing the, this back in 2013, I wasn't even sure if there were enough trails out there that I could walk on that would make a book. And um, it was very difficult to get trail information I went town by town. My, my goal was to find, I knew where the trails were sort of in Bellingham, but I was going to walk them, document them, and then I went kind of in concentric circles around where I lived and went to each town, contacted conservation commissions, just kept my eyes open, looking for trail kiosks, and then would just go out and explore and see what I found and document what was there. Um, before I knew it, I had a, a small collection, about 10 towns and about 35 trails. How about that? I had a book. Yeah, and and yeah. I, I, my other work is as a personal historian, I help families save their stories and put them into books. So I had already been on the self-publishing um, learning curve. So I already had the tools for how to do self-publishing and how to create a book. 
with self-publishing. So I said, I know how to do a book and just threw them into a book and then started publicizing them. To publicize a book, you kind of need to use social media these days. Yeah, Somebody sure. said, get a Facebook page. Well, what's the best thing to put on a Facebook page? Pictures of trails. Yeah. And so I started going to farther towns and that's where I wrote a second book called More Easy Walks in Massachusetts. And that's what Holliston is included in. And just our discussion beforehand, I still have more work to do. Yeah. Because there's more trails that I don't <laughs> know about that I'd love to explore. And that's for another day and another time. Well, but, I will just put in a plug for uh, farther down the rail trail. So if you were to go down the rail trail toward um, Axton Cross and in that a little bit beyond that, there's a property called Wenakeening Woods. Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. Well, Wenakeening actually has some lovely paths in there, including one called Pouts Lane, like a pouting child. And it was a um, one that the Indians used mm -hmm. when they left this area in the summertime and would move inland, inland up to Hudson, Sudbury, that kind of nice. thing. Nice. Okay. Um, and then come back in the summer and, and live around our lake. But anyway, that lane is still visible in there. When so really Woods is in, in more easy walks. Yeah, I a, have to confess that when I walked there, I got lost. I hope it's better marked since <laughs> I've walked there. That I don't know. I, went, uh, <laughs> I hold no claim to that. It was a very hot day and I was, it, I didn't have the most wonderful time. It hasn't, I really should go back and explore it again. Yeah. Well, but, and, and also after someone does do a walk, is there any point to contacting the local conservation department to say you know we really needed marking or absolutely i have actually worked with a number of conservation departments in the process of writing these books and have put to them if you want this trail in my book you need to mark it better and here and i've gone out and said this is poorly marked i'm not going to send young mothers with little children out here to get lost in the woods this has to be better marked or it's not going in the book. And just that little bit of incentive has made a huge difference. That's great. And, and so I've worked with a number of towns to do that. Good. Well, then I invite you to come to Holliston and check them all out because we've got <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of them. There's one, I mean, there's one that goes all the way from Washington Street all the way into Ashland. I mean, it go, it's a long, there's almost a thousand acres in there. Wow. Okay. And, and I, I'm sure it's not all well marked, but mm -hmm. boy, if any parts of it are, it would be worth worth knowing. That so. uh, uh, yet another project. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure you need all oh, these no, extra no. projects. Oh no, no. Actually, at this time, uh, at this time during the pandemic, uh, town-owned properties this is what I'm pointing people to to find places to avoid crowds, mm -hmm. because all of us are are more aware of that. Cra trails are terribly crowded, especially. The ones that are visible, yep. like rail trails, highly visible, yep. they're, they're dangerously overcrowded. There's, I'm hearing of bike accidents, uh, interactions between people and yep. bicycles. And so to seek out your town owned properties is a great strategy to find trails that not as many people are aware of. People in other towns are not as likely to be aware of them. They're not necessarily going to be as well maintained, not necessarily going to be well marked. It's a trade-off. Um, we went to one in Cumberland, Rhode Island yesterday that was a town, it's a town-owned property, and we saw two people mm. in two hours. Right. You just don't get that. And, and it just, it didn't look like much and we weren't real sure, but we tried it. Yeah. And it was wonderful. So you just don't know. So your new book um, is less of a guide to where to go, but a guide to how you can find them yourselves. Exactly. So I'm sitting around saying, okay, we've done all the trails in Holliston, but we're gonna go visit such and such a town it's possible that I could find an easy walk. How do I do that? What do I look for? I there's don't even several, know. There's several steps that my husband and I do, and this is a lot of what I document 
in the book um, is first we kind of pick a, an, an approximate destination and the internet is your friend. There's a tremendous amount of information that was not there when I first started doing this work mm. in 2013. Many, many, not all, many conservation departments have put up trail maps yep. of their properties there, or they've put lists or, and some of them have documented extensively. So your first place to look is by the town and conservation departments or trail, just put in search terms that are going to bring up stuff from that specific town yep. or that specific area. And is it true that you can find these places even in urban areas? I wouldn't say that I'm as much an urban authority. I tend to avoid urban areas <laughs> mostly because they're so crowded right okay, now. Okay, true. Um, I, I encourage, and I, that's what my sister who lives in Boston said, well, what about places? You have arboretums. Um, we have several in the Boston area and I encourage people, look, look for your local arboretums. When we travel across the country, our, one of our first stops is looking for where's an arboretum where we can see names of plants that we don't know in this area. True. So. Interesting, <laughs> interesting. It's fine, you're very welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so arboretums are a great choice. Local cemeteries. Mm, Urban some areas beautiful. have yep. some, they have, um, at least in Boston, was the first garden yep. cemetery. Yep. And so many, many urban areas have beautiful garden cemeteries. They're actually ideal for walking. And yeah. they have often will have paved or at least graveled paths because they expect visitors to come mm -hmm. to visit beloved family members. And actually, Holliston Cemetery, Lake Grove Cemetery, is built off of the Olmstead, which is what Mount uh, Saint, uh, yeah, what is it, Mount Auburn, Mount yeah, Auburn Cemetery, exactly. that model. Yes. Um, and um, although I must say that if I were looking for an easy walk, that might not be my pick. Just They're not because, always. Yeah. Um, you have to look. You know, go to your town hall and ask. Yep. And find out if there are any restrictions, because some of them are privately owned. Uh, some of them will have signs mm -hmm. that will tell you, but, but cemeteries are one of the places I encourage people to consider yep. that they might not necessarily think about. Yeah, so. and our, our community farm has a, a heritage kind of stretch where there's a, a par, you know, walking trails through there. So I guess anything that, that speaks to land preservation, open space, yes. uh, that kind of thing might be um, parks, you know, not recreation type parks where you find jungle gems, but they may be affiliated. There I mean, may, they be, may be, you know, there may be places like over in East Walpole, there's a Trustees of Reservation uh, Bird Park, and it's got the, um, the tennis courts, but it also has walking paths all through there. Oh, that and, sounds good. And a playground. So you never know. Yeah. Uh, town Commons. I also encourage people, uh, uh, Bellingham has a beautiful town common that the walking club goes and visits pretty regularly. And they're paved to walkways. They've got historical information. They've got benches, yep. which is nice for people who are new to spending more extended time outdoors. Fatima Shrine, the yes. one on Summer Street. I mean, they're, and they're year round. They it's keep lovely. It all they keep that shoveled. I think that's another thing is that in the winter time you do run into some of the uh, those issues in terms of trying to get past through this Acc one. Access is challenging. Yeah, I know we're talking right now as a community about how much and what can we do to keep this one open, this being the rail trail open right. during the winter. We, we don't traditionally do that. If there's snow, lots of people use it for uh, cross-country skiing mm -hmm. but normally for walking it can get pretty icy or, or you know snowy um, but this year because of the pandemic we're talking with the highway department and so forth to see if there's a way to keep at least some of it open so that it's um, the Minuteman bikeway in Arlington oh yeah that area is actually that they had the same debate 
and they learned that people were using it for commuting year round. Yeah. And yeah, so they else. ultimately decided that they did need to keep it open yeah. year round and they did need to maintain it. Maintenance and trails is a real challenge because it it's extra money. It doesn't, you only notice when maintenance doesn't happen, it's like housework. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's always there, it never ends. But you don't see it if it gets done. Yeah. We miss it, we don't pay attention nor honor it. Yeah. But it, it has, it's, it's an ongoing all the time. So tell me about the, the topics that you cover in the new book. Um, I, I looked at it, I, I was, I guess I smiled a little bit at the chapter that talked about animals because that's certainly one of the things that we hear over and over here on this trail. Uh, complaints about complaints dogs. Complaints about oh, dogs, complaints yeah. about people not cleaning up after dogs, occasionally right. complaints about not cleaning up after horses. Right. Um, you know, those kinds of things. Um, but um, animals and people conflict have been going on since uh, <laughs> colonial days that I've documented. I'm, I was a history major. I, you know, I, uh, when, when we expect people to change behavior, I, I, I kind of roll it, your eyes. <laughs> it's a, it's a rolling the rock up the hill. Yeah. Um, but in, in colonial days, the job of rounding up stray animals was given to the most recently married young man in the community. And so you really hoped somebody else would get married really soon because it was the <laughs> job nobody wanted. Seriously. It's a thankless task. It's difficult. It's, you know, you really hope that people have the best of intentions and it's, it's all about etiquette and caring, you know, putting yourself in somebody else's place and it's hard for all of us. It's, it's an ongoing life struggle. <laughs> so what things do you cover in the book, chapter by chapter kind of, that, that sure. would help us figure out where uh, we'd find? The first thing I talk about is what are easy walks. Um, <coughs> this, the second is um, how, do you, how do you, where, or, or what makes what are easy walks and I give a list including like what we were talking about um, places you possibly can look and what whatever because I tried to make it work beyond just New England centric yep. and places like Army Corps of Engineers properties um, and any conservation land trust look for your local land trust wherever those are mm -hmm. holliston has land trust with the wenakeening woods right is in land trust um so land trusts cemeteries arboretums state parks national parks um there's a, there's a large list of of various things that are your candidates that you're more likely to find them. Um, then strategy, the next chapter I believe is strategies and things like tell anyone you know you're looking for easy walks. You will get a longer list than you know what to do with and then you have to start deciding what you're gonna do with that. That's a, a great strategy. Stop at your local visitor center for your parks that you're at and ask the rangers, where are the places people don't as often go? You know, their, their job a lot of time is to redirect traffic so that it doesn't all go yeah, to together. one place. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the, I discuss a whole list of strategies to do that. Um, and then tools like not only the internet, which is a big place, but we use Google Earth oh, a yes. tremendous amount. That's a wonderful. When we, when we go to a new area, we will look at Google Earth to see if we can spot trails or if we can see along a coastline what the coastline looks like and if there are parks along the coastline, depending on where we're traveling. Right. We, all, we're use, we use Google Earth regularly. People don't think about it when they're right. saying where to go. You can't see everything about a trail. With, and, and some of it as strategies is, 
have a plan B. Don't just have one place and say, that's it. Well, the parking lot may be full. Yeah. And they've reduced sizes of parking True. lots During to reduce pandemic. overcrowding right now. So your, your desired destination may not be possible. You've driven an hour. What do you do now? You get a plan B. What's an alternative? Have a plan B in place while, before you leave so that you can say, oh, well, this is just down the road. Let's go check that one out. So that you don't just say, I give up. Right. And, and so I list a, a whole series of strategies to make it so that you have a more positive experience. And that's really, as, as through this pandemic, my husband and I have been deeply challenged to use the strategies that we write about and he'll say, I think you wrote about that in a book. And, <laughs> and the going, family joke now, huh? <laughs> we went to Maine and it was very crowded. We went to Acadia, which oh, was yeah. very, is probably sure. one of the most visited national parks, but we know the area well. And we ended up going off island to the Skudik Peninsula, also part of that same national park. There was no one there. Yeah. And we explored all around that area, which we had never made the time to do. So be willing to explore. Be willing to drive around and see what you find. We came across land trusts that we never heard of. Well, there are towns, actually just small towns or townships that have land trusts that are just very, very insular. They do, insular. they do. So How put in know? the term ta a town and land trust and see what you find. Yeah. Yeah. So those are, those are some of, I talk about um, uh, trail etiquette and things like when somebody's coming towards you, step behind the person behind you. Um, you know, pay attention to the signs on your rail trail to stay on the right or stay on the left, and there's no standard. Rhode Island has a different standard than Massachusetts. <laughs> of course. I know. Of course we do. <laughs> it is. It is crazy. Yeah. So, um, you know, trail etiquette. And then um, I talk about having a successful group walk experiences and things that you as a participant need to do if you've got special needs that you need to let the leader know about. If, and then I also address leaders of, of people who want to lead easy walks and things they need to keep in mind for people who are not necessarily their standard trail visitors. Right. And, um, you know, I just discuss a lot of that. And then the last chapter is actually targeted at uh, people who build or maintain trails saying, here's some things that you could do as trail maintainers that would make a huge difference for those of us who need easy walks. Mm. And that's from our own personal experience, the things that I have found really difficult and things, small things, that would have made it a whole lot easier. I would assume that those places where there are uh, rocks and roots and that kind of stuff are the, the worst, worst of it. But in terms of best of it, do you find the concrete that's on the top of the bridge or the gravel the trails sand. are much softer on my feet trails are softer on your feet they actually okay. are pavement yeah. i can only do a very just, limited amount yeah so that's the conundrum it's another yeah there's just so many considerations though and it is as mm -hmm. you said very individual the other thing is do you talk about safety and access to bathrooms <laughs> <laughs> Um, reached an age uh, where that got it's and, gotten to be an issue. <laughs> bathrooms are an issue. I do address um, that everybody goes and ex and being prepared to assist people peeing in the woods. Yeah. And about trail etiquette there too. You don't pee on the trail, and you certainly don't poop on the trail. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, that trail etiquette for those circumstances. I also talk about if you have medication, mm. that don't leave it in your car and think it will be fine. If you step on a ground wasp nest, 
and you're out on the trail, you will not be able to get back before you may have an anaphylactic shock. Right. And you must put that EpiPen in your pocket and someone else who's with you also know where it is. Same with asthma inhalers. Yep. Any other emergency medication, you have to be responsible for yourself. Yep. And, and these are things that you also need to let a group leader be aware of when you go. I always tell a group leader about my concerns because I tend to overheat and I get dangerously overheated. I only needed to bring water today. In warmer weather, I have a sprayer, I have ice collars, I have all sorts of things that I bring that I know I need to keep safe. But I tell people, if my face, and it's hard to see when you're wearing masks, if my cheeks start getting red. Yeah, I have the same problem. Please tell me. Yeah. And so I've got, I have strategies for that, but I tell the other person with me. And I also never walk alone. Yeah. So, um, you know, these are all per personal safety strategies that each person's needs are different, but you're, you really need to let other people know what they are and not just say, oh, well, that's my business. Right. When you're on a trail together, it's everybody's business. Well, yeah, absolutely. You're in a public space at that point. That's right. So what's the next book going to be? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't even imagine right now. I honestly didn't know that I was going to write this book until um, I had someone from L.L. Bean call me. It was a strange story um, because I have my website and I write lots of blogs. And so I'm out on the, the internet, people find me. And she was looking for someone to talk about easy walks and just Googled easy walks and found my name. And, but it, she, it was up in Burlington and my books didn't make much sense for Burlington, Massachusetts. Um, and, but I didn't just say no. Um, I said, well, I could talk about how you find easy walks and, and give people uh, information. Oh, that's the other thing that the book talks about is equipment. Things like walking, walking poles, mm -hmm. a fanny pack, boots, uh, layers, how to do clothing layers, thing, hat, things like that. And, and how, what are the appropriate clothes that are going to help you be comfortable and have a good experience? Hmm. on the trail so uh, but anyway at the end of the conversation we find I realized we had said I could do a program on finding easy walks <laughs> wherever you are and in retrospect that's, that's where the idea came from I didn't know but right. and it, it's ended up establishing a relationship with L.L. Bean I was able to get introduced to the more local Mansfield store people and they've sold my books and it's, I, I'm, the jury is out. I'm, I'm working to get back in touch with them now. The pandemic has made everything harder. Yeah. But, um, but I am in contact with them to see if they would be interested now in carrying more widely this latest book. Well, this latest book is definitely uh, a departure in that it is, it is uh, providing information in a, far more general way and then people have to sort and sift according to what's appropriate for mm -hmm. them. But I think it offers such a, such opportunity for, for, for folks if they actually will take the time to think about what it is that they're looking for before they set off on that little jaunt. There's um, no easy way to find easy walks. I did do the work in the first three well, books. Well, yeah, I was going to say, your first books <laughs> made it easy. <laughs> I mean, you know, but you're, this, this one's a little bit different. But the advantage to this one is that it is not limited by geography. So you can go just about anywhere. And if you want to step out of your normal, you know, that area. Was, that was my intention. Yeah. I also changed the title of the book. I originally, it was going to be Finding Easy Walks Wherever You Go. And I hadn't finished the book. And here we were, no one was going anywhere. And I said, we need to be able to find easy walks wherever you are. 
Yeah. And th so I actually did change the title because of the pandemic. The pandemic. And yeah, that has that has sort of distorted and reshaped how we do things for sure. I think we'll all. I see birds going by here. That's one of the things about walking is if you can find places where you can find interesting birds, that's what appeals to ah, me. Ah, yes. Yeah, that's, yes. That's sort of, and I think that that's something that people might want to consider when they're absolutely you know, as hobbies go. So. Mm -hmm. All right, so now the last thing I wanted to mention was that you now have a show on the Bellingham uh, I do. TV. I do, I do, by, by the same title as the book, Finding Easy Walks Wherever You Are. Okay. And um, we've only just done two episodes. The first one, I went to a town property. And again, I'm, I'm trying to use the tools from the book to illustrate, here's a town property. No one was there absolutely no one was there. It's a beautiful um, half mile easy walk that gets you to the banks of the Charles River. Oh nice. It's gorgeous. Oh. Uh, the dirt bikes had chewed it up quite a bit so it was rougher than when I had last visited and that's an ongoing issue between motorized and non-motorized vehicles too. Yeah. But uh, the second one I highlighted um, story walks, mm -hmm. which Holliston has one right. along the trail. They're a, a fabulous way to especially engage younger children in the trail and encourage families to do things together. Yep. Um, and so Bellingham is part of, it has the SNET yep. that goes through there and the rail trail committee puts up temporary story walks every month and they change the book. Yep each month. So uh, while it was still up, we went and filmed with some, my, I, and I got pictures of my grandchildren. I didn't have them with me for the filming, but um, there were, there were children yeah. along the trail. Yeah, I always thought that was a great idea. Our library folks came up with, yeah. So. It's great. Yeah, it really it's great. Is. It so, is great. and that's just one more thing I mentioned in the book was um, story walks and Google story walks and your area and see what comes up. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. There's a number of them. I think I will notice that, you know, for a Monday morning at a whatever, mid late morning, you know, it's been pretty steady for having people go by here. It's not packed certainly and not dangerous by proximity, but still weekends are the hard weekends yeah. are the hardest. That's when trails are most crowded typically. Yeah. Weekdays, um, it, if you want to, if you really want to make sure and avoid crowds, walk on a rainy day. Yeah. Nobody's out there, and it's still great. You know, make sure you got a good raincoat, and it's beautiful out on the trail on a rainy day. Yeah. The um, the interesting thing here is that our numbers have gone sky high, particularly since the pandemic, of course. But even before that, we were seeing, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people every day, therefore thousands and thousands of people every month. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's sort of impressive the, mm -hmm. the, how the numbers have gone. Oh, so. yeah. Well, Marjorie, thank you very, very much. I'm going to once again uh, repeat your name so that I can make sure that people know you have a Facebook page. So it's Marjorie Turner Holman. And you can you do have a Facebook page, a really good page. That's and you, Easy Walks in Massachusetts. Yeah, and that that little place though gets to your name, and then you can find your website, and folks can then go and explore whatever it is that they're interested. And in. And there's so. some links to the books as well. Yep. And the books are on Amazon. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me today out here. I think this has been a pleasant way to spend a morning. So thank you, Mary. This has just been a pleasure. It was. It, I just. I love the Eight Arch Bridge. Yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> and I love this trail. Uh, it's, a, it's just a joy to come out. A great excuse. The foliage is just amazing. Yeah, it has been quite the year. It's been quite the year. It is. All right. Well, thank you again, Marjorie. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. All right. Okay, so this is Mary Greendale saying goodbye until next time. And actually, I think our next show will be talking about the town meaning warrant. We have a town meeting, a special town meeting coming up in December. And so about three weeks before that, we'll definitely do a show about what's going to be up at uh, town meeting. That's always good for 
at least a few chuckles. So in the meantime, get out and enjoy the great fall that we're having. See you next time. Bye-bye.